Hello, welcome to the APO Productivity Talk. I'm Rie Minamoto from the APO Secretariat based in Tokyo, Japan. For today's session, we have an interesting topic that is social entrepreneurship and productivity. Social entrepreneurship has drawn a lot of attention over the last decades. It is an approach by individuals, groups, startup companies, or entrepreneurs to solve various issues such as poverty and lack of access to healthcare through socioeconomic interventions. So the question now is how social entrepreneurship could provide innovative social sustainable solutions to these problems and how it could contribute to inclusive development and productivity improvement. To take us further on this topic, we are honored to have Dr. Maria Lisa Dakkanai, the president of Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia, so-called ICEA, based in the Philippines. Good afternoon, Lisa. Nice to Good see afternoon. you. Good Thank afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, now, I'm pleased to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. Now, let me introduce you to viewers a little bit. Dr. Maria Lisa Dakanai is a pioneer in social entrepreneurship education and research in the Asian region. She has over 30 years of experience in development management and consulting, as well as in social entrepreneurship and enterprise development in the Philippines and other countries in Asia. Since founding ICER in 2008, Dr. Dakanai has led the research projects that proved the untapped potential of social enterprises in solving societal issues. In the Philippines, for example, the number of social enterprises jumped nearly 450% in 10 years, from 30,000 in 2007 to 164,000 in 2017. Today, Dr. Dakanai will discuss how social entrepreneurship could make significant impacts on addressing socioeconomic issues in Asia. She also will give us implications for its contributions to inclusive development and productivity improvement. After her presentation, there will be a live Q&A session. So if you have any questions for Dr. Dakanai, please pose your questions with your name and country in the live chat. We will answer as many questions as the time allows. Without further ado, we'd like to proceed to the presentation. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lie. And um, my topic, as Lie pointed out, is about social entrepreneurship and productivity. And I shall be having three parts of the presentation. First, I will be discussing social entrepreneurship as a global phenomenon then social entrepreneurship zeroing in on developing countries in Asia. Um, and my last uh, concluding um, remarks and uh, slides will be about social entrepreneurship for inclusive development and productivity improvement. Let me now go to social entrepreneurship as a global phenomenon. Uh, it's actually a phenomenon that is concerned with innovative solutions to social problems, as Lie was saying. And um, a scholar, Perini, in 2006, um, described it as entailing innovations designed to explicitly improve societal well-being, 
housed within entrepreneurial organizations which initiate, guide, or contribute to change in society. So social entrepreneurship usually entails three elements, no? innovations, they're explicitly improving societal well-being, and that there is an entrepreneurial organization leading the initiation, the guiding, or the contributing to the change in society. And these entrepreneurial organizations are what we call social enterprises. So in a research covering 55 countries, uh, there were 200 researchers. Uh, I was one among them. We did, um, this was led by the European Research Network, EMES, and um, we covered 55 countries using a bottom-up approach to capture the phenomenon of social entrepreneurship. And we've come up with uh, a few books, no? Uh, the EMES came up with a few books actually describing this phenomenon. And in this research, social enterprises were found to be responses towards new ways of sharing responsibility for the common good in today's economies and societies. And there are also responses on the basis of economic or business models driven by a social mission. No? So the main difference actually between social enterprises and ordinary businesses is that social uh, is that social enterprises are uh, social mission driven. No? Um, in Asia, we have discovered in this research no, that uh, there are three main models of social enterprises, what we call the entrepreneurial nonprofit model, the social cooperative model, and the social business model. And I will be discussing some of these models in my examples today. Let me now go to social entrepreneurship in developing countries in Asia and show you some examples, after which I talk about how social enterprises are making a difference in relation to poverty and inequality, the sustainable development goals, and this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, let me now give you some examples of social enterprises no, in Asia. In the Philippines, Alter Trade Foundation uh, is partnered with, has partnered or has helped to build the capability of agrarian reform beneficiary cooperatives and associations. And they have helped to federate these cooperatives and associations into NOFTA, which is actually the Negros Organic and Fair Trade Association. No? So Alter Trade transformed 800 plus assetless agricultural workers turned agrarian reform beneficiaries into entrepreneurial farmer leaders and members of cooperatives and associations that over time became supplier communities for fairly traded organic Muscovado sugar. But these agrarian reform beneficiaries and associations did not only become supplier communities, they also became vehicles for di diversifying their crops and incomes. So that, for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, no, these associations of agrarian reform beneficiaries and cooperatives actually did not go hungry or were, e were even able to share food with um, nearby communities because they had diversified their farms. Um, but the, um, this member, these cooperatives and associations also became lead organizations for community development, visioning, planning, and implementation. So that um, when I was actually studying them in my dissertation, um, every ag agrarian reform beneficiary community that actually was organized by Alter Trade had a community development vision and plan. No? And a community development vision did not only have to do with livelihoods, but they were also setting up community-based water and health systems. No? Um, Alter Trade Foundation also helped to set up the Negros Organic and Fair Trade Association as a federation of the agrarian reform beneficiary cooperatives and associations. Uh, and NOFTA serves as the voice of agrarian reform beneficiaries in the Alter Trade Board. And they, they also represent agrarian reform beneficiaries in joint ventures and negotiations. For example, NOFTA Fair Trade House is actually a joint venture between Alter Trade and NOFTA, and it's their trading arm. No? And its majority is owned by NOFTA. Uh, which means that NOFTA, which is the, uh, the Federation of Agrarian Reform Beneficiary Cooperatives and Associations, is the majority owner of this um, trading arm of this social enterprise system. They also use, of course, NOFTA to get better terms with sugar mills, no? uh, because they, some of the sugar that they actually produce, they, they sell to the sugar mills. Let me give you another example from Thailand. No? From agrarian reform beneficiaries, we go to fishers. Uh, in Thailand, uh, there is an enterprise called Fisher Folk Enterprise, which was co-developed uh, with Oxfam as a blue 
um, as a uh, co-developed with uh, Oxfam as an organization that would create uh, a brand of responsibly fished, uh, fresh formalin-free seafood. No? Um, we all know that in seafood distribution, uh, many unscrupulous traders use formalin, for example, to make the, the fish look fresh. No? But um, Fisher Folk Enterprise was actually uh, ha had partnered with Oxfam to develop this blue brand of responsibly fished formalin-free seafood. And this enabled uh, the Fisher Folk Enterprise enabled the fishers through this uh, blue brand um, initiative uh, to be engaged in a community-based coastal resource management and a, a sustainable fishery process where uh, they actually, uh, they, the fish that is fished from these processes um, is uh, sold no? through uh, a blue brand in the Fisher Folk Enterprise. And one of the one of the benefits is that uh, the fishers are able to get better prices and higher incomes for their produce. No? So, so that by being um, engaged in sustainable fisheries, uh, the blue brand of fresh, responsibly fished and formalin-free seafood allows uh, the fisher folk enterprise to actually provide um, healthy fish to consumers. No? But there's also Lemon Farm Cooperative which is actually acting as a market channel for Fisher Folk Enterprises' blue brand of certified seafoods. No? But uh, Lemon Farm Cooperative does not only sell the Fisher Folk Enterprises' blue brand, but they also sell 3,000 other natural and organic agricultural products of small-scale small producers certified through participatory guarantee systems. No? So uh, Lemon Farm Cooperative, which is actually a market channel for the Fisher Folk Enterprise and the 3,000 other natural and organic agricultural products of small-scale producers, is owned by 28,000 consumer and producer households, we, uh, and they have a chain of 11 groceries in Bangkok. No? So uh, earlier, I showed you that um, um, Alter Trade Foundation was uh, as a, is an example of a um, social enterprise. Levon Farm Cooperative is another example, and they one is a foundation, this one is a cooperative. Um, the other example I'd like to share with you is in a is a is a social enterprise that works with indigenous communities. Uh, Bata Central um, actually set up the Philippine Coffee Alliance as uh, an alliance of community-based coffee enterprises. And in this example, I would be showing you um, the relationship uh, of Bota Central and the Philippine Coffee Alliance with one of their members, which is Tricom, the Sultan Kudarat Coffee Ventures, and the uh, Kulaman Manobo Dulangan Organization. No? The Kulaman Manobo Dulangan Organization is a partner indigenous people's organization of Tricom, an NGO, and a social enterprise called Sultan Kudarat Coffee Ventures, which is actually a joint venture between Tricom and Kulaman Manobo Dulangan Organization. And uh, they actually are engaged, the partnership is engaged in the production, processing, and marketing of Cape Dulangan. No? So they have their own brand of coffee and they sell this to a growing local market. And the good the good thing about this is this part of an ancestral domain development plan of the Kulaman Manobo Dulangan organization. No? And SKCBI, the Sultan Kudarat Coffee Ventures, is one of 50 community-based coffee enterprises in the Philippine Coffee Alliance that is led and assisted by Bote Central with their Coffee for Life program. No? The Coffee for Life program of Bote Central uh, assists community-based coffee enterprises and their partner uh, indigenous communities or farmers to produce coffee beans sustainably, to process and market their own brands of coffee, and to get a more substantive share of wealth created in their value chain. No? So that there's about 5,000 farmers, women, and youth all over the Philippines who have actually been engaged to set up community-based coffee enterprises organized in the Philippine Coffee Alliance. Uh, a fourth example I would like to share with you is Suham in India. 
So uh, SUHAM is, uh, stands for Sustainable Healthcare Advancement, and it's a trust that was set up in 2007 serving healthcare initiatives of people's organizations. They are actually engaged in community health and nutrition, sanitation, and safe water, and their flagship initiative is the setting up of eight community hospitals in three states. No? And through these community hospitals, uh, they're able to provide cashless health services for the poor, where they actually are able to provide 60% of the market price uh, together with a mutual health insurance scheme that makes the poor um, of, um, that that makes it accessible uh, for the poor members in these people's organizations. Now, so during the COVID-19 pandemic, they were actually serving the poor by providing wellness centers um, at their doorstep and through virtual services. They were also providing mobile clinics for early diagnosis primary healthcare clinics as hubs and of course in order for uh, for for them to handle specialty care no uh, secondary hospitals such as the community hospitals that i was talking about are there and referrals to tertiary hospitals are, also, are actually also done no so uh, through this strategy suham is able to provide univer universal health access to the poor in these states uh, the last example I would like to provide with you is Common Room and Common Room in Indonesia, and which they have actually uh, they've partnered with Kasepuhan Ciptagelar. No? This is a village, an indigenous village in uh, West Java, and they have developed together a community based local internet service. Uh, and they, this is an initiative that has bridged the digital divide and have, have connected the unconnected in far-flung areas in Indonesia. So the model includes Common Room Networks Foundation handling the conceptual framework and operation, managing the tripartite agreement and the finance and administration of this uh, community-based local internet service initiative. Uh, so Kasepuhan Siptagelar, the indigenous community, who are the primary stakeholders and beneficiaries, they actually handle the resource mobilization, local support, voucher distribution, and local technical assistance. And they have a partner ISP company called Awinet, which handles local internet infrastructure development, bandwidth and licenses, as well as technical support and maintenance, knowledge and skills transfers. So uh, since they've set this up, uh, the outcomes have been internet connectivity for 29 remote villages by mid-2021. They have created new jobs uh, because they have created voucher agents and technicians in the system. And then they've also increased internet connectivity to support uh, remote education processes. And uh, internet access has also been directly supporting COVID-19 pandemic preparedness efforts in the region no? because of the uh, of the lockdowns and all the internet access to support COVID-19 pandemic preparedness efforts in the region were very critical. So these are five examples of uh, social entrepreneurship initiatives in various countries in Asia, in developing countries. And uh, you could see that in the context of worsening poverty and inequality in Asia, Social entrepreneurship has evolved as a strategy for recognizing, growing, and mainstreaming social enterprises as key partners in enabling the poor, marginalized, and the women at the grassroots uh, to have access to basic social and economic services, to become productive stakeholders in economic value chains linked to sustainable consumption and production, and they're also to contribute to and benefit from increased, increasing productivity in ways that transform their lives, communities, and living environments. So before the pandemic, social enterprises were actually considered as game changers in accelerating the sustainable development goals. No? Before the pandemic, the sustainable development goals, which were supposed to achieve no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, decent work and inclusive growth, inclusive and sustainable industrialization and innovation, reduced inequality, gender equality, peace, justice, and strong institutions, responsible consumption and production, all these goals were actually in danger of not being achieved by 2030. And the United Nations system was looking at social enterprises as possible accelerators for the sustainable development goals. No? And um, 
be because of that, in the Asia Pacific, we were actually poised with UNSCAP to set up social entrepreneurship, uh, sustainable development goal acceleration platforms no? in order for us to create platforms, multi-stakeholder platforms that would support social entrepreneurship as a strategy to accelerate the sustainable development goals. However, with the impact of COVID-19 on social enterprises and the poor they serve, social enterprises, this SESDG acceleration platforms have been transformed by us into platforms for inclusive recovery and building back fairer. Because of course, before social enterprises could actually do their role as accelerators of the sustainable development goals, they themselves need to recover. No? And the poor that they partner with need to recover. So these platforms that we have set up in Asia Pacific are serving as learning exchange and building a community of practice among social enterprises, projecting collective impact among social enterprises, engaging governments to provide enabling environments for social enterprises and to support social entrepreneurship as a strategy. And also they're engaging with other sectors in partnership building and cross-sectoral collaboration to support social entrepreneurship. So what are these um, platforms for inclusive recovery and building back fairer that we set up? Uh, one is We Leave Food. No? Uh, it means women's empowerment, livelihoods, and food in agricultural value chains. And here we are actually promoting a set of benchmarks and guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment um, as um, strategies for building back fairer in agricultural value chains. We also have as platform Decent Work for All in Sustainable Value Chains, a Health for All platform, uh, rural Revitalization, Youth and Social Entrepreneurship Platform, and Technological Innovations for Sustainable Development. No? So some of the examples that I gave you about the social enterprises are actually part of these platforms. And we are using these platforms to, uh, as I said, no, to actually um, have a community of uh, practice, to project collective impact, to engage government as well as to promote multi-stakeholder collaboration so that social entrepreneurship social entrepreneurship can be uh, promoted as a strategy for inclusive recovery and building back fairer. Now, let me now go to uh, social entrepreneurship uh, for inclusive development and productivity improvement, which is actually the interest of many of you who have actually come to this um, session. No? Uh, first, I will provide some insights from some from studies that we have done on social enterprises and social entrepreneurship and talk about impl their implications on social entrepreneurship for inclusive development and productivity improvement. Um, in our study of uh, social enterprises in developing countries where poverty and inequality are uh, stark realities, uh, they have uh, evolved social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders or what we call SEPs. No? Um, and some of the examples that I showed you are all actually social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders. There are social enterprises that engage agrarian reform beneficiaries, that engage fishers, that engage indigenous people, women, that engage um, uh, youth in poverty sectors and uh, they, we call them collectively social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders. They are uh, social mission-driven organizations. Apart from being social mission, social mission, about apart from being social mission-driven, they actually create wealth. So, and but more than creating wealth, um, they actually distribute the wealth created to the poor who are their primary stakeholders. Now, so these are the three main characteristics that we have seen social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders to exhibit. No? They, uh, they explicitly pursue poverty reduction and alleviation as a primary ob objective. They're engaged in the provision of goods and services, uh, but uh, unlike ordinary enterprises that are just a uh, uh, providing goods and services for profit. Um, social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders generate positive economic and social value that is distributed and benefit the poor as primary stakeholders. So uh, we also um, have found out that uh, the social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders have uh, provide different types of services to the poor. No? So unlike ordinary businesses that 
mainly provide transactional services, which are actually oriented at assisting people to become effective workers, suppliers, clients, and micro-entrepreneurs. No? Social enterprises also provide social inclusion services, which is oriented at providing the poor immediate access to basic needs and social services, such as uh, community-based systems of water, health and sanitation, provision, provision of health services through community hospitals, and as has been shown in my example also, ICT services. And then uh, social enterprises also provide transformational services. No? So they are oriented at enabling the poor to become, to overcome their capability of deprivation and to become actors in their own development. So um, social enterprises organize the poor into self-governing cooperatives, as you saw in the examples as well. Uh, they actually also do leadership development and capacity building on gender issues. No? So it is this combination of transactional services, social inclusion services, and transformational services that social enterprises do uh, among, po among the poor. And that's the reason why they're able to help transform the lives of the poor. Um, in terms of models um, of social enterprises and their impact on the poor, we have seen that there are two main models. Uh, the first is what we call a collaboration model, and the second is empowerment model. Uh, collaboration models are when the poor are actually engaged as partners in social enterprise and value chain management or engage the poor as workers, suppliers, and clients of social enterprises, whereas the empowerment model engage the poor as transformational and transactional partners, as empowered workers, suppliers, clients, and owners. So that in some of the examples I shared with you, the poor are actually co-owners no, of these social enterprises. So um, through, the, through the empowerment model, uh, the poor are organized as partners in poverty reduction, community, and sector as well as societal change. No? So we've we've noted that um, in these two models, no, that they impact on the poor differently. Uh, when a collaboration model happens, uh, this impacts in terms of increased incomes and access to services among the poor, resulting to social inclusion. Whereas the empowerment model actually assists the poor to have significant um, to to overcome capability deprivation and income poverty. You know? So this uh, combination of models are seen in many social enterprise initiatives all over Asia. So having presented to you the examples and these insights from the studies that we've done, uh, maybe the concluding remarks that I would be leaving with you this afternoon is that social entrepreneurship uh, are very is a very important strategy for inclusive development and productivity improvement. By providing the poor and marginalized access to basic social and economic services, social enterprises are actually making a direct contribution to improving their productivity and ensuring that they that they are not left behind. No? So, uh, as you saw in the examples I shared with you, uh, it, they provide the poor access to ICT services, to health health services, and to uh, actually economic services, uh, including uh, live livelihood. Um, development services. By enabling the poor to become productive stakeholders of sustainable economic development as well. Uh, if you saw in the examples that um, the, you know, the blue brand, for example, of fisheries is from um, sustainably fished fish, yeah, seafoods that are from community-based coastal resource management areas. And then or the other uh, social enterprises are actually producing and marketing organic vegetables and organic um, organic um, food. Yeah. So social enterprises make a direct contribution to improving national productivity capability and sustainability. No? So the poor, uh, before they were engaged by social enterprises, were actually not productive no? uh, members of society. Or if they were productive, they were actually uh, experiencing uh, many challenges in terms of becoming um, to, um, in terms of achieving their full productivity. But as um, stakeholders of social enterprises, they have become productive stakeholders, not only in economic development, but in sustainable economic development, no? which, has, uh, which addresses um, 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 ecological sustainability. And thirdly, by empowering the poor to contribute and benefit from 
uh, the value and wealth created in the economy in ways that transform their lives, communities, and living environments, social enterprises make a direct contribution to ensuring that improvements in productivity and growth of national economies are actually both inclusive and sustainable. So this is the main point I think that I would like to share with you, that the reason why social entrepreneurship has a very important role um, in inclusive development and productivity improvement is that uh, social enterprises are not just contributing to productivity improvement per se, but uh, they are contributing to this in ways that make it in that uh, that make it inclusive and sustainable. No? So thank you very much, and I hope to interact with you in the open forum. Thank you so much for your great presentation by sharing examples and the trends of social social entrepreneurship and implications for inclusive development and productivity improvement based on your research. We appreciate your sharing and insights so much. Okay. Now, thank you, Leah. We'd like, yeah, thank you so much. Now, we'd like to move on to the Q&A session. Again, allow me to encourage everyone to pose your questions for Dr. Dakanai with your name and the country at the YouTube live chat section. We will be looking forward to participation. Okay. Lisa, before taking questions from viewers, I'd like to ask you some questions. Sure, sure, Leah. Go ahead. Yeah. The first one is about roles of ICEA. Through your presentation, we could get to know several cases of social entrepreneurship in Asia, led through platforms among different organizations. So now, could you introduce a little bit about the roles of ICEA on these initiatives and promoting social entrepreneurship? Yes, thank you, Leah. So uh, the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia is actually a consortium of social enterprise practitioners, social enterprise resource institutions, as well as scholars from 10 countries in Asia and the Pacific. And there are three main uh, roles that we do. No? First is capacity development. Second is research or knowledge creation. And the third is building of platforms and doing advocacy to engage government and multi-stakeholders in order to support, support uh, social entrepreneurship. No? And uh, so for, uh, let me just give you some examples. Uh, one of the first uh, books that Isaiah published was actually Measuring Social Enterprise, which are actually composed of cases and tools uh, such as uh, social return on investment and development indexing for measuring social enterprise impacts. No? So we do research in order to use them to provide uh, cases as well as resources for our capacity development uh, programs. No? But we also do research, for example, recently uh, in a project that we have with Oxfam, we create the, we did, we had a, a multi multi country research that uh, resulted to the benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's and economic empowerment in agricultural value chains and this is a set of uh, if you may benchmarks or uh, standards that we are promoting for agricultural value chain stakeholders to contribute more to transforming the lives of women and men small scale producers no and we did this through research and we use this to actually set up a platform no the one of the platforms that we actually uh, i actually mentioned in the um, in the presentation the women's empowerment livelihood and food in agricultural value chains platform we promote these benchmarks through that platform so that agricultural value chain players can contribute more to um, to become to make um, the women and men small scale producers benefit more from agricultural value chains yeah and uh, there's also a policy research that we did and we we came up with a set of guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains which the same platform is using as um policy advocacy tool so that asean and asean governments for example can um uh, can adopt a set of guidelines that would contribute to the promotion of the benchmarks. No? So that, and um, of course, we also uh, provide consulting services so that agricultural value chain players, including social enterprises, can uh, be assisted no? to actually um, 
uh, at, uh, practice the benchmarks. No? So we have scorecards. We have created scorecards in order for us to use as um, planning, monitoring, and evaluation tools so that practitioners can be assisted to improve their practice uh, in, in, in improving the lives of women and men small-scale producers. No? So those are the kinds of um, things that we do. So we do research, education, and building of platforms for social entrepreneurship to become a major strategy for uh, uh, sustainable development in Asia. And with the pandemic, um, you know, social entrepreneurship as a strategy for uh, inclusive recovery and building back fairer. No? Because I think uh, even as governments are engaged in the recovery of the economy, we need more efforts to ensure that the poor are included no? in the recovery process. Back yes. to you, Yes, thank you very much for your explanation. I see you are doing a wide range of activities for social entrepreneurship. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so now I would like to ask some questions on some important points that you mentioned during your presentation. The first point is about capacity building. Yeah. As you explained in your presentation, there are opportunities for marginalized people to join the social and economic system through social entrepreneurship. Yeah. Moreover, capacity building is very important for them when wanting to become more productive. Yeah. Yeah. However, there might be many people who had limited access to education when they were young or who have little experience of doing business. So considering those backgrounds, can you tell us difficulties of capacity building and how to overcome these challenges? Yes, actually, uh, social enterprises, um, especially at the startup stage, no, uh, of course, all uh, are in the process of um, engaging the poor as, um, you know, either workers, as suppliers, as um, clients. And this entails capacity development. And um, so, actually, when we we encourage social enterprise resource institutions to provide two types of financing. No? Uh, the first type of financing is grants, and the second type of financing is enterprise financing. That's what we call hybrid, right? Uh, the reason for the grants is that in order for us to engage the poor to become effective players, no? to become effective stakeholders of social enterprises, they need, as you said, to be capacitated. No? And not only capacitated to do to produce the quality, to produce the quantity, and to produce uh, what is needed um, by the market, yeah. But they also need to be organized as uh, into self-governing institutions, usually as associations and cooperatives, yeah. And this entails resources. Uh, that's the reason why we actually are uh, espousing with government that. Uh, to support social enterprises, they need to make provisions for hybrid financing, no? um, high, uh, financing in terms of grants so that what we call transformational services can be provided to the poor to enable them to become effective players in the market and to become effective uh, players to transform their lives. No? Because they're not just uh, passive stakeholders in social enterprises. When we engage the poor in social enterprises, we want them to be effective um, not only in contributing to become to um, contributing to the production of products and services the, that the market needs, but we, we we need to engage them in a way that will improve and transform their lives. Yeah. So uh, the grant part of the hybrid financing is what ensures that. No, because without that, I think it would be very difficult for us to just engage the poor, not to become workers, to become suppliers or to become clients um, because that entails as you said capacity development and so um, we're in, we are actually advocating that government provide hybrid financing for social enterprises so that they're able to provide this um, transformational services to the poor and also we encourage social enterprise resource institutions to provide this type of hybrid financing to social enterprises so that they can engage the poor effectively so of course uh, i wanted to say another thing now during the pandemic as we know face-to-face uh, -face trainings and face-to-face -face capacity development has become very difficult no? one of the examples i showed you was um, common room in indonesia and they're providing uh, ict services no um, setting up 
ICT services in remote areas. And I think community networks na, that uh, which common room, for example, set up in um, in Kasepuhan, Chiptagalar, no, in the village, in, in a remote village in Indonesia, that's an example of um, um, initiatives that we need more. We need more of because as we, I think as we go back, um, as we develop, as we uh, move forward no, uh, towards inclusive recovery, we need more of this community network so that remote areas can actually be uh, access, uh, can actually be reached uh, for purposes of education or even, as I said, no, in the case of Common Room, uh, their internet services was key in the COVID-19 preparedness efforts in the areas, yeah? Yes, uh, we imagine the situation is changing because of the COVID-19 and there are new challenges for those you know, marginalized and the poor people. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing. And my next question is also related to the previous one, which is about social inclusion. Yeah, I believe that social inclusion is one of the keys for social entrepreneurship. Yep. So can you tell us how we can encourage and motivate the poor and marginalized people and the women into social entrepreneurship. Mm. Can you share yeah. with us from your experience? Yes, uh, that's a very uh, important point. No, I think um, I'll just give you an example about how uh, Alter Trade Foundation, for example, encourages the poor to actually become uh, partners. No. Um, they engage the community of small producers in a process of community visioning, community development visioning, and community planning so that they're able to dream again, you know? Because one of the things I think that the poor uh, need to get out of is, you know, the survival mode. So I think uh, one of the important um, roles that social enterprises do is inspiring the poor to actually become actors in their own development, yeah? And, um, and through tools such as, or through capacity development programs such as community development, visioning, and planning, you know, the poor are assisted to dream again, yeah? And to dream again of a better future and to become stakeholders of social enterprises. Of course, there are many ways that social enterprises do that, but I just gave one concrete example so that it's clearer yeah and uh, this is very important because when the poor are engaged you know you, it's uh, because of the culture of poverty um, it is important that we're able to motivate them uh, to become actors in their own development no? so even as we engage them as workers we engage them as suppliers we engage them as clients it's important that we're able to motivate them to see beyond the transactional roles no, that they play. And that's the function of transformational services. No? Transformational services to the poor uh, that are provided by social enterprises um, assist them to build their capability to become actors no, in their own development. So that uh, in the best practices of social enterprises we see, uh, they even become co-owners no, of social enterprises. Thank you very much for your sharing. Yes. Then now I would like to take some questions from viewers uh, since we have many questions from them. The first one is related to the uh, previous questions uh, that you answered about the investment for the social enterprises. Uh, this is from Masa in Japan. Mm -hmm. The question is, who would usually be the capital providers when setting up social enterprises? Are they NGOs, government, international organizations, or local people itself? Yeah, the investors, no? the investors for social enterprises are many. No? Of course, um, the, the poor who become part of social enterprises, they're usually assisted to do savings and credit programs first in order for them to have, uh, you know, a counterpart in the investments in social enterprises, yeah? So that's part of the capacity development that social enterprises do. Uh, so that, for example, in a, in a case of a card, no? 
um, a microfinance institution in the Philippines. They actually have engaged uh, the poor in savings and credit programs so that they, the clients you know, that were borrowing from them before are now co-owners of um, their banks, you know, the card bank. Um, so th there are ways of engage, um, there, there are ways for uh, the poor to become actually investors in social enterprises themselves. Yeah? But for the most part, uh, when we talk about startup social enterprises, uh, we usually have social enterprise resource institutions that are dedicated to actually um, providing um, this financing that is needed by social enterprises. Uh, but be because in many countries, social enterprise uh, resource institutions are not yet plentiful. Uh, we usually have social enterprises go to banks no? and go to go to cooperatives and go to um, others, other financial service providers uh, that are, you know, that are providing um, enterprise financing. And that's the reason why we are encouraging uh, government or not, we're not only encouraging, we're we're actually pushing that government uh, um, makes uh, an investment for social enterprises to have access to hybrid financing. Because for the most part, uh, social enterprises can, of course, try to access funding from financing institutions, no? but they can only get uh, enterprise financing, loans, for example. Uh, but the transformational services needed to, uh, for startups especially, to become um, to to start their social enterprises, that is where we we see the need for grants. Yeah, so the, the combination of grants and enterprise financing is uh, what we really need. So in the the capital providers, no, uh, what the capital providers are many. Uh, you even have um, social investment um, uh, arms that have been set up already. And uh, they also provide financing as well to social enterprises. But I think the bigger problem in terms of social enterprise financing is having the access to those two kinds of financing together. Yeah. And that's why we're encouraging social enterprise resource institutions uh, and social enterprises to work with us to push government to actually uh, set up these kinds of hybrid financing required by social enterprises. Yes, thank you very much for your response. So it was a question about the investment for the, you know, to start up the social enterprises. Then we have some questions about sustainability of social enterprises. Because social enterprises have to balance the social side and business side. So social side, they provide, you know, benefit to people. And at the economic side, the business side, they have to sustain their businesses. So let me introduce uh, three questions about these financial challenges to sustain their business. The first one is from uh, Chandra Shah. The question is, how sustainab sustainable are social enterprises? For example, are there many which have lasted more than 10 years? Then uh, let me introduce the next question. Then uh, this is also the question from the same person. What strategies are used to sustain the enterprises over the long period? Then we have a similar question from Japan, Mr. Masa. What would be the difficulties to pursue profit and empowerment of the poor at the same time? So, yeah, there are a lot of uh, interest about the financial sustainability, and the sustainability of business. Yes. Yeah. So, could you respond? Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you for those questions. Actually, in the Philippines, we did a study about uh, the financial situation of social enterprises prior to the pandemic. No? And... Um, we found out that it was those social enterprises that were sustainable prior to the pandemic that actually survived as well during the pandemic and did better. Uh, so to the question, um, how sustainable are social enterprises? Like all enterprises, I think there are social enterprises that have 
find that had found it difficult to sustain themselves and there are social enterprises that have reached financial sustainability and uh, i think the challenges are many um, you know, uh, when I used to teach at the Asian Institute of Management Entrepreneurship, we always uh, were were concerned about the sustainability of enterprises, no? And we know that 80% of enterprises actually fail, yeah? There's only a 20% success rate of ordinary enterprises. And social enterprises are even more difficult uh, to actually sustain because they don't only think about profitability, they think about empowerment and actually benefiting the poor who are their primary stakeholders. No? So social enterprises, because they think of this double bottom line, usually have to become more creative in order to become sustainable. Uh, for example, there are social enterprises like in the case of uh, Common Room no? and Kasipuhan Chip Tagelar. The reason why they're able to actually uh, provide um, provide um, uh, internet services no, to the to the villages is because of the of the strategy of cross subsidy no uh, they actually have paying and non paying customers right and uh, of course uh, a big part of the investment during the re during the setup phase was provided by um, um, the the APC, which is actually a partner organization of uh, Common Room, no? uh, in order for them to start up. Yeah. So um, in many cases, uh, social enterprises need uh, startup grants in order for them to actually uh, reach a point where they are able to uh, serve um, the markets that they serve in a sustainable way. No. But um, so there are the the this this uh, strategies of cross subsidy are very important especially for social enterprises that are serving the poor uh, in terms of health services for example um, in the case of uh, suam no? the 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 provision of health services to the poor the hospitals that provide health services to the poor the reason why they're able to sustain that is because they've set up a micro ins uh, micro micro health insurance scheme that uh, uh, helps to finance no? the health services uh, to make the hospital sustainable. And, um, but actually, in many, in many, um, in many cases, uh, the social enterprises that, uh, for example, many fair trade organizations, no? uh, they actually are engaging um, the poor in developing countries and their markets are usually uh, in um, in developed economies yeah and uh, the fair trade organizations that are social enterprises uh, usually provide fair trade premiums no they provide um, funds back to the supplier communities that they support in order for the supplier communities to use them for purposes of uh, community development, for example. Um, so in relation to uh, financial sustainability strategies, uh, I think on the whole, uh, social enterprises, of course, need to be supported to uh, reach sustainability in a manner that would be appropriate to the nature of services that they provide. Yeah. So particularly for those that provide health services, IT, ICT services, and what we call social inclusion services, no, where you want the poor to have uh, access to these services immediately. No? Usually, they start out with uh, some sometimes grants, and then over time, a process or a strategy of cross-subsidy is able to make them sustainable. Um, in the case of uh, social enterprises that provide livelihood um, livelihoods to the poor, of course, this affords the poor um, access to greater income, and over time, they're able to fend for themselves uh, in the same way that social uh, and the social enterprises become more sustainable as the poor as stakeholders become more sustainable from uh, their um, from uh, the from the life from the livelihood, the sustainable livelihoods that they're able to get from um, engaging with the social enterprises. No? Okay, thank you very much for your sharing the insights and the information. And there are many questions 
are coming from viewers. So as time allows, let me introduce one by one. The uh, next question is about the impact investment uh, from Ani Kartikasari. So the question is, what is the role of impact investment organized impact investment organizations in financing social entrepreneurship? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I think a controversial one. <laughs> uh, why do I say it's controversial? Because impact investors are actually wanting to achieve um, profitability uh, returns no, from their investment, and they usually want higher uh, returns for their investment, but at the same time want to uh, get social returns as well. Yeah, And that's a big challenge. No? And uh, one of the things that we've noted with impact investors is that they only provide um, they only provide uh, enterprise financing. Yeah, uh, usually the tr the 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 financing for transformational services so that you're able to engage the poor uh, effectively as workers, as suppliers, as um, as clients, and as owners even of social enterprises. Uh, impact investors are not usually concerned with that, and uh, that's a problem. No. Um, it's part of our advocacy that we, we're pushing impact investors to actually become more of social investors so that they understand the hybrid financing that social enterprises need to become effective transformational partners of the poor. Yeah, because we're not uh, just talking about making so social enterprises sustainable per se, but we're wanting to make sure that social enterprises are able to engage the poor effectively. No. And uh, I guess that's the challenge that uh, we have had some dialogues with impact investors. And uh, the, the, the point I think that impact investors need to better understand is that the poor are starting from a position of marginalization. And because the poor are starting from a position of marginalization, social enterprises that want to engage the poor as uh, workers, as clients, as uh, suppliers, um, will actually need that kind of financing to enable the poor to become these economic actors that they have been deprived of because of their poverty, no? because of the structural uh, inequities in society. And maybe up to this point, I haven't seen social investors effectively respond to that. So, um, so impact investors have tended to actually uh, finance enterprises that are already, uh, you know, a better off than the the uh, the startup as well as the social enterprises that are re that are really. Um, struggling and that are really needing financing to actually become sustainable yeah so uh, i guess i'm critical of impact investors because uh, from what i've seen um, they haven't uh, made an impact in relation to really helping social enterprises to engage the poor uh, in a way that is transformational Thank you for your thought, sharing the thoughts. Yeah, then now uh, let me move on to the next question from the viewers. Uh, this might be difficult to you know, answer. Now, what is the success rate of social enterprises? This is a question from Chandra Shah from India. That's a very difficult question. Yes. No, because, uh, you know, one of the things that we haven't done, and that's because of the lack of resources, is to really have a survey of social enterprises in every country in order for us to know this. Yeah, uh, We have only managed to do limited surveys as well as um, limited uh, case studies, right? Uh, and usually when we do case studies, we focus on case studies that have succeeded in order for us to get the lessons, uh, for these lessons to become, uh, to become um, you know, insights when we teach social entrepreneurship to practitioners and other stakeholders. No? So uh, it's, it's difficult to answer uh, the success rate of social enterprises because I think government needs to invest to actually have a 
you know, a a survey, a proper survey among uh, social enterprises so that they can, so that we can answer your question, Chandra. But um, from the from the surveys that we have done no, uh, among social enterprises on the web, uh, and actually yes. uh, that the the case studies that we have actually done. A big number of social enterprises that have survived have, of course, become sustainable. No, so it's a myth, and it's it's a myth that social enterprises cannot be sustainable. Um, and I think if the success rate of ordinary enterprises is twenty uh, percent, right? I think uh, because um, maybe we can we can assume that there can also be a difficulty of social enterprises to become sustainable, but for for now, I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, to uh, give a figure because I think uh, that is something that we haven't really studied and we haven't had the resources to study. Um, but um, in the Philippines, where we have done our most extensive uh, researches on social enterprises, we have found uh, that you know, the, for example, the study on social enterprise action research that we did uh, for social enterprises uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, no? the effect of social enterprises, uh, the, the effect of COVID-19 on social enterprises, about more than half were actually sustainable prior to the pandemic. Yeah, and uh, But maybe we, because it was a survey on the web, we were able to get the more sustainable social enterprises. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for sharing. So we will wait for your further research and yeah, in the future. Okay, uh, anyway, uh, let me apologize one mistake. Uh, Chandra Shah is, Mr. Chandra Shah is not from India, uh, he's from Australia. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, yeah. Okay, so let me move to the next question. This is from Mr. Joshua Lau. Is there any successful cases of deep tech, deep tech social enterprises in your experience? Um, I'm not sure I understand the word deep tech, yeah? Uh, because for example, common room, um, common room in Indonesia that I shared with you is actually uh, providing internet services no? to uh, to uh, communities, no? to far-flung communities. Um, and then another social enterprise that I shared with you, Bote Central, the one in coffee, uh, in the coffee value chain, they're actually using artificial intelligence to use as, uh, you know, to use to, um, because they actually provide agribusiness support services, including technology for community-based coffee enterprises to process their own coffee beans. No? Uh, and so they use artificial intelligence to actually make sure that the coffee is always roasted well. Yeah. So uh, if you consider AI to be a deep tech, uh, <laughs> to be a uh, to be deep technology, then yeah, uh, you know, I uh, there are some social enterprises that actually use artificial intelligence. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, so we have two more questions from viewers. So can I introduce two of them? Yeah. Then the first sure. one is yeah. Thank you. First one is from Mr. Salima Talib from Malaysia. Her question is, what is your advice to implement social enterprises over the CSR program being implemented across organization? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. CSR, by CSR you mean corporates, no? Um, yes. how, how can corporate organizations or corporations support social entrepreneurship? Maybe that's the question. And that, that's a very good question because that's something that we have also tried to answer uh, in terms of engaging corporates. And uh, one of the main um, advocacies that we have, for example, in the promotion of the benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains is that we that corporations um, actually engage um, social enterprises in a way that would provide them markets no for example agribusinesses uh, they can serve as markets for social enterprises but they can also actually be the 
recipients of their CSR programs so that they can get grants in order for them to support social enterprises to engage farmers or to engage agrarian reform beneficiaries or indigenous people to capacitate them to become effective stakeholders of the agricultural value chain social enterprises yeah so um because CSR programs of companies provide grants yeah i think uh, CSR programs can uh, provide the hybrid financing that is needed to support social enterprises. No? So it's a combination of grants and enterprise financing or loans and uh, even equity. Yeah? But of course, if you're a corporation, you would probably not provide equity. Yeah? But um, I think because CSR programs are providing grants mainly uh, to communities, right? Uh, when they engage social enterprises, those grants can be provided, can be given can be put to good use uh, when you actually link it to your main business. No? So in the, in the example that I gave you, agribusinesses can provide markets for social enterprises, but at the same time, they can also provide the grants in order for the social enterprises to engage uh, the supplier communities effectively through organizing and the like. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So uh, can I ask you a follow-up question? Are there sure. any uh, companies that are doing you know, by themselves social, you know, social activities, I mean, social enterprise or say, social entrepreneurship things as a CSR you know, project or yeah. program? Well, actually, yeah. there, are, there are CSR programs that are supporting cooperatives, yeah? And because cooperatives, uh, as long as the cooperatives are actually already social, there's they're a form of social enterprise. No, so cooperatives of farmers, cooperatives of fishers, and indigenous people. Usually, when um, CSR programs engage cooperatives or support cooperatives, they are supporting social enterprises in that sense, right? And mm -hmm. um, we have also found that uh, uh, CS companies practicing CSR uh, do also. Uh, support social enterprise development yeah so for example in the case of the philippines again uh the the the, the bank of the philippine islands has a program called bpi sinag uh, it's a program that they have together with another social enterprise resource institution called bayan academy and they actually provide um it's they they actually look for social enterprises to support right uh, through, they have a competitive uh, process of choosing about 10 social enterprises every year in order for them to support them, uh, in order for them to be supported uh, through uh, coaching as well as through uh, and a little uh, grant. Uh, uh, so there are companies that are actually engaged in uh, the promotion of uh, social entrepreneurship. Uh, okay, I see. Thank you very much. Then uh, let me pick the last question from the viewers today. Uh, this is from Ani Kati Kasari. The question is, to what extent does legal infrastructure support the growth of social enterprises in Asia? For example, tax benefits, etc. cetera. Yeah, so, uh, thank you, Ani. Um, you know, there are very few countries in Asia that actually have uh, legal frameworks for social enterprises. And that's the reason why we are proposing for governments to actually uh, incorporate um, in their uh, uh, as laws, no? social enterprise laws. Like in the Philippines, we are actually promoting, uh, we're advocating a poverty reduction through social entrepreneurship bill. And we have been doing that since 2012, right? Uh, but there, I, uh, as far as I know, uh, the tax incentives or the tax benefits have supported social enterprises in, uh, I think, in Korea, um, where there is a social enterprise law there. But I need to be updated about what's happening uh, now. No, but um, many of the developing countries, I think, in Asia, do not have social enterprise laws yet and much less no 
uh, provisions of tax benefits for social enterprises. But in the poverty reduction through social entrepreneurship bill that we are proposing, as well as the guidelines, no? that we are actually promoting with uh, the ASEAN and ASEAN governments. We are proposing that uh, social enterprises be given tax benefits uh, in order for them to um, in order for them to be um, in to be given incentives. No? Um, but sometimes tax benefits is quite um, is quite uh, controversial. That's actually one of the reasons why the poverty reduction through social entrepreneurship bill in the Philippines is has not been passed. No, it's one the tax benefits to provided to social enterprises is one of the main questions um, of the Department of Finance. And uh, what we are trying to negotiate actually in the process is. Uh, what we call tax credits, no? Maybe uh, you know, uh, tax credits can be provided to social enterprises because of the uh, social benefits that they're providing, and that could be given value, and then they can actually be credited with, uh, you know, they can be cre they can be given tax credits rather than tax benefits. But in other countries like the UK and in Europe, no, uh, the tax benefits are a, a very important part of. Uh, the legal the legal infrastructure support in the growth of social enterprises in Asia. Um, I I think Rai uh, Lie was actually mentioning that in the Philippines, social enterprises grew from thirty thousand in two thousand seven to one hundred sixty four thousand in twenty seventeen. That did, that wasn't because of government support. That was despite of government support. What does that mean? It means that social enterprises are really very much important. No. And they are growing despite government support. So you could you just imagine what can happen if government supports social enterprises? I think social enterprises will even grow by leaps and bounds. But at the moment, that is not the case in many developing countries in Asia. And uh, maybe there is some so, uh, the support for social enterprises I know is happening in Taiwan, is happening in Singapore, and to a certain extent, Malaysia. But as I said, and Korea, of course, no. But um, maybe even Japan. I'm not so sure if in Japan there is support for social enterprises in different ways. Yeah, they might not be called social enterprises, but there's some form of support to cooperatives, for example, and the like. But um, in many developing countries, the legal infrastructure to support social enterprises, even the recognition of social enterprises, is still not there. Yes, thank you very much for your thoughts and insights. So uh, this is the last question uh, from myself. Uh, mm. Since today, I think we have many viewers from the government agencies watching this live. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah, we discussed yeah about you know some of the government role in terms of the finance and the legal infrastructure. Mm. But uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, Fari, what are your expectations in the future on the roles of government and the cross-sectoral partnership to promote social entrepreneurship? Yeah. I think governments, as well as other sectors, including the private sector, have a lot to play, have a, an important role to play in the development of social enterprises, uh, particularly in mainstreaming social entrepreneurship as a strategy for inclusive recovery and building back fairer. You know? So I, I think it's important that uh, we're able to um, encourage, we're able to have governments uh, put in place uh, a social enterprise uh, bill or law that would support effectively you know, the development and growth of social enterprises in various countries, especially given COVID-19, you know, uh, where um, economic recovery is actually being supported by governments. Um, maybe we could think about social enterprises as vehicles so that economic recovery can become inclusive and can become sustainable for the poor and marginalized sectors of society. So we're hoping that we can work with governments to put in place um, the legal infrastructure, the policies, as well as the programs that would provide support to social enterprises, not only through uh, the, by recognizing social enterprises as players in inclusive recovery and building back fairer, by actually providing support 
uh, in the form of uh, hybrid financing that I was explaining, or even providing benefits such as tax benefits that was actually raised uh, by the audience no? in terms of uh, helping social enterprises uh, grow. Uh, but I think um, in the final analysis, Social enterprises will continue to grow by leaps and bounds because the poverty and inequality, I think, is more now than ever before. With COVID-19, uh, the situation has become uh, worse than before, I think, and social enterprises can play an important role so that um, uh, the recovery process is inclusive and is sustainable for the poor and they will not be left behind. Yeah, that's really encouraging. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for answering a lot of questions. And uh, I, I have to apologize because there might be some questions that I couldn't pick up today because of the time constraints. Now it's almost the end of the session. And as a wrap up and your final remarks, could you give a message to our viewers who are watching today's live? Mm. Yes, um, thank you, Lee. Uh, I think uh, social enterprises have a very important role to play in empowering the poor uh, to contribute to and benefit from the value and wealth created in the economy um, in ways that would transform the lives, communities, and living environments of the poor. And uh, maybe uh, in this way, because social enterprises make a direct contribution to ensuring that improvements in productivity and growth of national economies are both inclusive and sustainable. We hope that we can work with uh, governments, we can work with the private sector to create the enabling environment that we need for social enterprises to become partners uh, for inclusive recovery and building back fairer. Thank you. Thank you very much for your inspiring message, Lisa. We really appreciate your time. Today, we learned from Dr. Maria Elisa Dakkanai about social entrepreneurship and productivity. I hope this session gave helpful information and inspiration to all of you. So for viewers, thank you very much for your active participation with your questions. The APO will host more productivity talks and other digital programs featuring different guest speakers. Please join our series next time as well. We'll be looking forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you very much, Elisa. Thank please you. Yeah, please take care and goodbye. Thank you.